song because we're acknowledging the God that we serve is a holy God, a God who is set apart. And so thank you for that. A couple things I want to share quickly also in light of what I've just shared is in a month on the second Sunday of February, we will be having an all-church meeting. I will fill you in and give you more details of what's going on. I will update you. I will give you some visioning of some things that God's been placing on my heart uh, as we move into the, this coming year and into the things that are going to be happening. And so keep that on your calendar. I encourage you all to be there. It's going to be important that you be there, and you'll hear a little bit more of what's going on. By then, a little bit of all the reactionary stuff will have settled out just a little bit based on the last couple of days. So uh, just know that, okay? And I'm also pleased. Uh, you know, I have some wonderful colleagues in ministry. And I, I, I've got a, there's a couple other pastors who are here today, and, and they've been here before. But one, Mike Keating, Mike, raise your hand. He's a pastor out at Cimarron. He's the Beagley's dad. Uh, and so uh, just know that it's always good to have them here. And Jerry as well, who I pick on a lot on Facebook, and I love her dearly. And uh, it's just a wonderful time to have them here. And thank you. Thank you for being here. We welcome you. And then uh, as many of you, uh, I know some of you have met uh, Wendy moeller Seib and her husband Chris back there. Clear back there in the corner because they have two kids. That's why they're clear back in their corner. Uh, but Wendy is an incredible, I've known Wendy a long time. She and I have been in ministry together. We've done some things together over the years. We had a prayer time here on a Thursday night one time. And, and so uh, I'm just excited that she and her husband have been coming to church here. Long story to all of that. But both of them bring wonderful gifts to our church. And so we are blessed and we will tap into those gifts. I told her, I, told, I said, Wendy, here's the deal. We're not going to just put you on a committee. All right. We, she would run fast the other way, uh, but she has wonderful gifts, and so I'm grateful that both of you are here. Uh, so welcome, welcome, welcome. All right. All right, here we are. 2020, right? 2020. Go to the next one. That's where we're at. There we go. There's something about this day that neither, neither one of our projector guys can figure out when I say 2020, that's when you hit the 2020 button. But uh, the last one, we had to go on and on for quite a while, but uh, I think they got it going on now, so we're good. So 2020, uh, new year, the old is gone, the new has come, amen? For some of you, you are thrilled about that. I mean, I've talked to many who are saying, okay, I'm really happy that 2019 is behind me, and as we move into 2020... Uh, that uh, there's some new things on the horizon. So if you had one of those tough years last year, you know, God, God has been with you, will continue to be with you. If you had a great year in 2020, let's just rock on and keep, or 2019, let's just rock on and keep going, all right? You with me on that? You good? All right. Now, normally, here's what I do on the first Sunday of, of the year, uh, as far as the Gregorian calendar is concerned. <laughs> Remember? Okay. Um, I usually do one of these kickoff sermons, one of these old is gone, new is come, Isaiah type of thing. I mean, I, I, do, I usually do one of those things. Here's the teaser. You have to come back next week to hear that sermon. <laughs> All right? Because that sermon is coming next week in light of some things that God has done in the last couple weeks to prepare for this particular day. Okay? So come back for that. In the past few months, I have shared with many of you uh, all of you, actually, that it's important for us to keep our spiritual antennas up, all right, to pay attention to what God is doing, to be sensitive to the work of the Holy Spirit and enter into that work and what he's inviting us to do, to be listening to what people are saying, what people are doing, what God is doing, and all, all of this. And so it's led to a conversation in the past couple of weeks with regards to prayer, prayer, now, I, I mentioned this a couple weeks ago in a sermon. As I was working on one of my uh, Advent sermons, all of a sudden my computer went ding, and this email came up. And usually I don't look at emails while I'm working on a sermon, so I'm not distracted. But, you know, this is one of those good distractions. I opened it up, and it was from someone at the church who, uh, I'll share more about that later, but just uh, said, hey, God's been speaking to me, and I want to share this with, with you. What do you think? And so... It had, had to do with prayer, and I pondered uh, that. And so in light of that and that conversation, where we're going today, I've entitled this message, Living on a Prayer. Sorry, Bon Jovi. All right? Living on a Prayer. Some of you got that. 
There were some others in the first service going, what are you, what's a, what's a Bon Jovi? Is that like a Bon Voyage? Anyways, uh, we're halfway there? No, we're going to be all the way there, baby. Okay, anyways. Uh, so what about this thing? What about this thing we call prayer? Now, I think it's interesting because uh, JP came up to me here just a little bit ago and said, guess what we're studying in our Sunday school class? The prayers of Jesus. Timing. God's got it going on. All right? So we're going to be talking about prayer. And, you know, if I'm going to talk about prayer, I, I, could, I could do a series all year long on prayer. What it means, what it is, what it isn't on it. I mean, all the stuff that goes with prayer. Okay? What I want to do is, is just address a couple things today, mainly one. But uh, I have this book. Some of you maybe read it from Pete Gregg named, uh, entitled How to Pray. Anybody read this book? Oh, read this book. You can buy a vow. Re read the book, How to Pray, A Simple Guide for Normal People. That'd be us. All right? Pete Gregg, great, great book. He wrote a book, if you ever really, 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 really struggle with prayer, he wrote a book called God on Mute that will help you. But this one here, let me just read a couple things from it because it's setting the table for what we're doing today. And here, this is at the very beginning of his introduction. Every pilgrim gets a stone in their shoe eventually. Anybody? Yeah? You wake up one morning thinking, is this really all there is to knowing the creator of 100 billion galaxies? You read the book of Acts and you ask, why isn't it like that anymore? Your world falls apart and you desperately need a miracle. You stare up at the stars and you feel things bigger than religious language. You say to yourself, if this thing is true... There's got to be more power, more mystery, more actual personal experience. And so, finally, you turn to God. Half wondering whether you're any more than half serious and say, Lord, teach me to pray. And the Lord responds. He says, I thought you'd never ask. And away we go. Well, he goes on to say some things in his book. In this first chapter, when he talks about prayer being our native language, if you think about it, he, he references our English word prayer coming from a Latin word, uh, precarious, where we get the word precarious, because life is precarious. There's some days it's awesome. There's some days it stinks. There's everything in between. There's the ups and downs. There's all of the precariousness. Is that a word? Say yes. Of, of life. All right. And so uh, he goes on and mentions this psychologist who says, uh, describing prayer as the soul's native language, our natural posture is attentive openness to the divine. And then he gives all sorts of illustrations. I just highlight a couple here. But he, he mentions this novel, One True Thing by Anna Quinlan. She depicts the agony of being 19 years old and watching her mother receive chemotherapy. Drop by drop by God, please let it work, drop. And in that, she struggles and she says, but I, I prayed to myself without form, only inchoate feelings. One word, please, 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 please. That was it. That was her prayer. And I was talking earlier and someone said, oh, I know that rock group. The Foo Fighters. Anybody heard of them? Or Nirvana? All right. This, this, the guy named, named Dave Grohl, the, the singer there, and, and uh, they were talking about how he lost his drummer to a drug overdose and how he was reeling from that. And he says, I'm not a religious person, but I was out of my mind. I was so frightened and heartbroken and confused. And then a gal named Elizabeth Gilbert, in, her, in one of her memoirs, Eat, Pray, Love, she writes, Hello, God. Are, how are you? I'm Liz. It's nice to meet you. I haven't ever spoken directly to you before. And then she starts to cry and cries out to God, can you please help me? Can you please help me? I'm in need of help. And it says, as her tears subside, she experienced a peace so rare, she says, that I didn't want to exhale. Didn't want to exhale. Didn't want to you know, inhale, exhale. I didn't want to exhale for fear of scaring it off. I don't know when I'd ever felt such stillness. Then I heard a voice. She said it wasn't an Old Testament, New Testament kind of thing, uh, although she didn't even know what that really meant. 
She just said, it was merely my own voice, but this was my voice as I've never heard it before. Well, on and on we go, and finally in this, in this chapter, he says, uh, from, from primitive cave paintings to the whitewashed walls of the Royal Academy, the universal impulse to pray permeates and pulsates through human anthropology and archaeology, sociology and psychology. It is no exaggeration to say that to be human is to pray. I encourage you to read the book. To be human is to pray. You see, that there is something. There is something in our DNA. There's something innate within us that causes us to pray, that leads us to pray. And, and people will maybe, maybe want to refute that, but yet people are a people of prayer. Whether they even call it that, whether they even believe in a God or not, people pray. Interestingly enough, independent of the understanding of it. So there's something there. Now for me, and I think for you too, you know, people say, you know, you've heard this before, are you a Christian? And maybe, maybe your answer ought to be this. I don't know if I'm a Christian or not, but I am a follower of Jesus. Because that, that, that pretty well nails it. All right. So as a follower of Jesus, I know this. If Jesus prayed, then I know I should too which I think is going to come out of that lesson you guys are doing in JP's class. If Jesus prayed, and I'm going to follow Jesus, then I know I must too pray because he prayed. Now, Paul would agree. The Apostle Paul, you've heard of him. He would agree. And he, he, in his writings, he reminds the church specifically today of the responsibility to pray. So I just want to pick a few verses here, and, and then we got some cool stuff going to go on here. So just hang on, all right? You open to the work of the Holy Spirit, anybody? Okay. Here we go. From Colossians 4, 2 through 6. Here's what Paul is saying to the church, some instructions to the believers. All right. And here's what he's saying. Devote yourselves to what? Prayer. Being watchful and thankful. And pray for us, too, that God may open a door for our message so that we may proclaim the mystery of Christ for which I am in chains. Chains aren't going to stop prayer, by the, by the way. Pray that I may proclaim it clearly as I should. Be wise in the way you act toward outsiders. Make the most of every opportunity. Let your conversation be always full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that... That's the great Greek henna clause. It means so that, therefore... You may know how to answer everyone. All right. Now, I don't have time to go through this in a real exegetical, expository way in, in every bit of this text. But I do want to lift up some things that are important. We're going to talk about prayer. And prayer is interesting because it's simple and complex all at the same time. Right? There is a simplicity to prayer. Because think about the little kids when they pray. It's very simple. And yet they're having a great conversation with God. And yet it's complex in, in, all, that, in all that goes on with prayer and, and, you know, trying to understand and figure it out and all these kind of things. Now, for our purposes, I want to talk about prayer a little bit today about a conversation with God. And so let's just have a conversation, all right? You know, as we begin 2020, I cannot overemphasize the importance of prayer in our lives as individuals, as a body, as the church. Because, I mean, we're in crazy times, all right? So we need to be prayed up. And as, as uh, Pete Gregg would say with, a, with an acronym, he says that we might pause, rejoice, ask, and yield. P-R-A-Y. I love it. The kids are just jumping right in. Pause, rejoice, ask, and yield. Again, I don't have time to go through all that. But I want, I want to help us understand and I want to emphasize prayer truly needing to play a larger role in the life of who we are here at Asbury, in our life as Christians, as Jesus followers. So there are three, the three B's, three imperatives, and this is just going to happen quickly, so hang on, all right, that play out. The first is this, be devoted in prayer. That's what Paul says, be devoted in prayer. 
Now, it's interesting, when we take a look at this word devoted, it comes from a couple Greek words, meaning pros, kartero, meaning towards, steadfast, endure. And so we have this word devoted. And here's what it means. To persist, to persevere. Keep on keeping on. Press on. To continue steadfast in. To continue to do something with intense effort. That's why I use the word intentionality a lot. With intense effort. To give constant attention to. That's what this word in the Greek and what Paul is trying to help the church understand as well as us. To be devoted. To persist. To persist. To persist. Keep at it. Persevere. Do not give up. If you think God's not answering your prayers and you just prayed it yesterday, you need to keep praying. All right? Even if it was a year ago or even 10 years ago. I know a lady in Salina who prayed 17 years for her husband and he came to Jesus. She went now to be with him. He's now serving in the church. Serve him right. Right? So think about that. In Luke I, I believe it's in Luke 18 where there's this persistent widow. You remember that story? The persistent widow who came before the judge crying out for justice. And she just kept bugging him and bugging him and bugging him. She would not take no for an answer. And she kept bugging him. And finally the judge says, you are driving me insane. This is my story. Actually, it's this story, but I'm just giving it into words. You're driving me nuts. You're driving me batty, woman. Okay, I'll give you justice. Because I can't take you coming in here anymore. Now, just think how much more God will answer our prayers, provide equality, fairness, justice, etc., those things, when we persist in our prayers with a God who does care about us and loves us. It's a discipline to be devoted. It's a discipline. you got to keep at it. Secondly, the second B, be watchful. Be watchful, Okay. Now, it's interesting in the Greek, I believe it's, it's, this, it's not just point action. It's be watchful uh, and continue to be watchful. Now, here's this word, watchful. Here, here's what it means in the Greek. It means to stay alert, to stay awake. <laughs> Stan knows exactly where I'm going with this. <laughs> he said, I heard you called me out in the 8 o'clock service. Well, I didn't really call you out. I was just giving an example. But here's the deal. It's really not stand, stay awake. It's not 1125 type of thing. It, it, it's, more, it, it's, it's beyond that. It's, being, it's that of paying attention, seeing what God is doing, uh, being alert in the sense to be sensitive, to know that God is doing, and then to act upon that, to be vi vigilant. It's like a neighborhood watch with a sign up. We are vigilant. We are watching over one another. It is to show great attention to detail. I was telling the first service, when I was in the Dominican Republic with JP a couple years ago, was on the, on, the, on the bus on the way back to the airport to come home. And all of a sudden I get this text. It was one of our neighbors said, hey, I'm just checking. Everything okay? You know, I haven't seen you around for a little while, and I noticed Mary Lou's walking by herself and just making sure everything's okay. That's awesome. That is awesome. That's being vigilant. That's being watchful. That's paying attention. It's okay that he knows my rhythms, our rhythms, and so forth of what goes on. That he's checking in. That's what we're talking about. Being watchful. To watch and keep watching. Pay attention. And then thirdly, the third B is this. To be thankful. I don't have to go into a whole lot about this. I think you know what it means to be thankful. Here's the word thankful, which just merely means the giving of thanks or that of being grateful. Okay? The giving of thanks that of being grateful. Paul's speaking in, uh, with regards to an understanding of all that God has done. To be thankful to God. Emphasis upon what God has done. Now, I want, I want to lift something up that's really important. All right? You can read all you want about prayer. You can study all you want about prayer. You can take all the classes you want on prayer. You can go to all the wonderful conferences on prayer. You can listen to what Pete Craig has on prayer. It's awesome. But until you pray, you will not come to grips with prayer. Until you pray. But I don't know how to pray. That's a prayer. 
That is a prayer. When you cry out to God and say, I don't know how to pray, that is a prayer. And he says, all right, now we're getting somewhere. Let me help you. All right? <laughs> and then we can go from there. Going and read, reading about and going to conferences and all those kind of things does not replace prayer. It doesn't replace it. We're called to pray, even as inadequate as we may feel at times. I remember Maxie Dunham one time, I was sitting under some of his teaching years ago at, at, at I don't remember where we were, it was down south somewhere, and uh, he said, now don't, don't push me too far, and, and, and I probably told you this before, but he says, you know, there are some things that God cannot or will not do unless we pray. And he says, no, you know, don't push that too far, but there's something about our prayers that move the heart of God. And God is ready to push the green light, or to, to push the button for the green light, if you will. But he's waiting on us to pray. Okay? To pray. And that's part of our calling as Christians. To pray. That's why on Wednesdays, I cannot overemphasize how important it is that we're praying. And not just on Wednesdays, but when we do that, when we intentionally come together to pray... Uh, that we fast, that we set some time aside, that we pray, that we pray for God's guidance, we pray for God's direction, we pray for God's wisdom. And then also we pray for some of the stuff that's going on in our own lives, but ultimately we go because God, you are God and we are not. And we're just lifting you up. We're just praising you. We are giving you all honor and praise and glory which is due to you. To God be the glory. It's the doxology of going in that room and praising God. Thus we get together and pray. We're called to be a people of prayer. You know, Paul was instructing the believers. And now in verse 3, here's what he does. He shifts gears for just a little bit. Don't forget he's in jail. And here's what he says. And pray for us too, that God may open a door. There's a lot of great scriptures on opening doors. Open a door for our message. So that... Therefore, the why, so that we may proclaim the mystery of Christ. And there's more to it. Now, here is where Regina Tear comes in. Okay? So hang on. If you don't know who Regina is, you'll get, I'll introduce you here shortly. But uh, so that day I get this email. Remember? Okay. <laughs> Just making sure we're... Stay alert. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I, I know. I'm just messing with you here. All right. If you're new here, forgive me. I am who I am. <laughs> okay. So I get this email, right? Regina sends me this email. She's the one who sends me this email. All right. And I'm not going to steal all her thunder here, but I am going to set the table just a little bit. Because she said, you know, You've been saying this, and you've been saying this, and this, and God's been saying this, and this, in light of what you've been saying, and here's what I'm thinking. What say you? These are my words. And I'm going, oh, yeah. This is so awesome. You know, you remember the two words, what if, a couple times, a couple through some of the sermons? The what if, you know, the what, well, what if, what if God is speaking through somebody? Are we going to listen? Or am I going to just have to preach because I'm the senior pastor, and she's not getting any time? For crying out loud. What if, what if we become a people of prayer? What if we actually pray during church? Oh, glory to God. What if? Well, Regina, why don't you come up here and share what God has laid on your heart and then share with them what, is, what at least we think is going to maybe happen today. And in the meantime, come Holy Spirit. Good morning, everyone. So, like... Rick said, I sent this email, but let me kind of back up and tell you what happened before that. Um, on my 20, 30 to 40 minute trek into work each day, I spend, that's my time that I have my conversations with God. So as I'm discussing with him and having my talk, I'm reflecting on what's been frustrating me. And then I t start praying and God turns my thought process to you need to pray for Rick and Mary Lou. Okay, God, I do. You know, he says, no, the church needs to pray for them. And it needs to be, they need to lay their hands on them. They need that. 
not only because of you know what's going on now, but you you got to look at what they've been through the last several years, what they went through last year, what they're going to go through this year. They need to know that we're here, and you're the one that's going to tell Rick. I can tell him that I don't have a problem with that, but don't you know? Don't get me out of my comfort zone. Well, of course, Rick has to get me out of my comfort zone. No biggie. So this vision comes to me as we're talking and we're going on, and God just says, you know, tell the congregation to come and pray for them. Have them kneel at the front. Have them come as an individually, not necessarily as a whole group that we've done in the past, but individually pray for them. Lay their hands on them. Pray for the strength that they're going to need, the strength that they've had. Let them know that they're loved by us. We got their back. Um, also, tell the congregation to pray for those that don't know God, that don't have God's love. Those are the people that are committing the stabbings in the synagogues and doing the church killings. They need to know about God. The timing with this is impeccable. It's God's doing. It's no other way because I had no way of knowing that the media would jump on this right now. We need to go out and we need to show the city, the world, about the love of Christ and who we are. And that's kind of what this is also going to be. Because once you get done praying, if you feel led to pray for Rick and Mary Lou, just go off to the side, pray with somebody else. I don't, you know, it's, this is the vision that God just said to, to tell you. Go off, pray with somebody else about the different circumstances that are going on. Give God the glory. Let the Holy Spirit work. Rick and Mary Lou, if you'll get your pillows. Because <laughs> I did tell, suggest that maybe they get a These know. are to kneel on, not to take the nap, all right? <laughs> so. Uh, but I'm not so sure he didn't do that before. No, yeah. he, didn't, he didn't do that before. Can you pray grab it? Real quick, I want to add a couple of the verses because I did share with him the Colossians that it's intentional that we pray. But it's in Psalm 55, 23, cast your cares on the Lord, and he will sustain you. He will never let you let the righteous fall. Come and be part of this group and, and let them know that we are behind them. Let the Holy Spirit work through you. Susan, she's going to kind of finish leading us in. As Regina said, um, if you can come forward and pray for Rick and Mary Lou, please do. If you can't pray, uh, if you can't come forward, please pray where you are. If you need prayer today, we have a couple of people who are willing to go where you are. Or if you want to come up, if you want to come up and pray as well and you don't want someone to pray over you or with you, we are not going to be offended <laughs> if you say, you know, I just need some alone time with the Lord. Um, if you want to come up and pray for someone else, you know, this is just a time of prayer as a church family for each other over our leadership. And so join me as we begin. Father God, we are so very thankful for Rick and Mary Lou. We are blessed here at Asbury. Um, to have Rick carrying the vision of who you want us to be for us. And we know, Lord, that he just earnestly seeks to serve you and to have us be a church that um, is who you want us to be. Um, Lord, we are also very thankful that here at Asbury we know who you are and whose we are and who we're serving. <laughs> and so we pray that you would clarify for Rick what this next year means, that you would bring to fullness and completion all that you've been working out um, in us and lead us into a new beginning, a new creation of what we can be. Lord, we're so thankful for Mary Lou because we know that um, she balances out um, Rick's energy, Rick's desire to maybe sometimes move ahead before he should. Um, she and, and, and Rick, Rick and Mary Lou together are such a complete picture. Um, a complete example of how they lean into one another and balance each other out. And so give them both the strength and the energy 
and the peace and the wisdom and the clarity that they need um, to take us forward into whatever you have for us. Lord, we do lift up the body of Christ around the world. There's so much going on everywhere. But especially, Lord, we know that there is something that's going to happen to the people who call themselves United Methodists. And we are thankful that we do not have to worry about what that is because you have it all figured out. Lord, whatever happens, may we be gracious to one another, loving one another, allowing each other to make the decisions that we feel we have to make on behalf of Jesus that we may then go forward in mission, go forward taking that grace and that love and that passion for who Jesus is out into the world. Lord, please do not let these four walls confine us. Let us be a church that daily is getting words from you to give to someone else and planting seeds and, and going out there to the broken and to the hurting because you know what? We're part of the broken. We're part of the hurting we have things going on in our lives, Lord, that um, you are working through and you're glorifying yourself through. And we want that for everyone else we meet and everyone else we see. They may never set foot in this church, Lord. That's okay. Let them set foot in the Bible. Let them seek you in truth and in your word and who you are, Lord. Let them know your love and your wholeness and your forgiveness for themselves because we have received it in such great abundance in Jesus Christ, our Savior. So, Lord, we lift Rick and Mary Lou up to you. We lift Asbury up to you. We lift our denomination up to you. And we declare you Lord over it all. And we ask you to go before us now in this time of prayer. Lord, if someone's hurting... May they come to you for comfort. If someone is confused, may they come to you for wisdom. If someone just needs a touch from their neighbor who they have sat next to in the pew for six months now, let that happen. May your Holy Spirit fall abundantly upon us as we love on each other in prayer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. There was a wonderful series by J.D. Wald who does the Seedbed Daily Text between Christmas and New Year's, and God has laid it on my heart to share a little bit of that with you. And by the way, if you're in your seat and you want someone to come and pray with you, would you please raise your hand so we know who you are? We are happy to come to you. Hebrews 11.6 says, And without faith it is impossible to please God, because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. It is important to understand that earnest... This is J.D. Walt on the Daily Text. It is important to understand that earnestly seeking God does not mean revving up the engines on what you are already doing. It can't be reduced to getting up an hour earlier, reading a chapter longer, praying a bit bolder, and otherwise trying to do more than be a better and more devoted Christian. Let's call this the struggle of striving. Earnestly seeking him is something altogether different. It requires a different mentality and mindset. We must shift from the ascent mode of striving for God into the descent mentality of abandonment to God. Faith does not require striving. It invites outright surrender. Some weeks ago, I was with my close friend and constant encourager, Brian. We were talking about eating healthy when the conversation turned to sugar. He said something to me that lodged a splinter in my soul. He said, John David, 99% is hell, 100% is heaven. Your big problem with sugar is you bounce around with your food choices between 1% and 99%, but you have never gone to 100%. Once you go 100% in, you will be done with sugar and there will, there will be no more choices. Let's just say the dominoes in my soul began to fall. 1 to 99% is the continuum of striving, the country called commitment. 100% is the zone of surrender, the country called consecration. 
Like a New Year's resolution, striving and commitment are seductive, all at once requiring enormous effort on our part while keeping us 100% in control. It's why they seldom survive January. We never left the old country. We just doubled down our efforts on trying to find a better way in an old place. Surrender and consecration, consecration take us out of the old country. They don't show us a better way, but a better country. We are no longer in control at all, but we have ceded our control to a sovereign beyond ourselves. We now belong to Jesus, which means bringing to the which me which brings meaning to the originating creed of our faith, Jesus is Lord. The greatest proverbial leap of faith is not from unbelief to belief, but from striving to surrender and from commitment to consecration. It is to move from the continuum of 1% to 99% to the country of 100%. It's not about revving up our commitment, but giving up our control. Now here's the interesting part. We don't actually leave anywhere or anyone behind. Though we are still surrounded by the old country, we begin to see the new creation springing up everywhere, both from a distance and yet gloriously up close. We discover life not according to a better way, but by a new way entirely. We become citizens of heaven with an earthly address, doing things we never imagined possible with people we thought were too good to be true. Asbury Church, you are my people who are too good to be true. You are a phenomenal church family. Let us all step forward together into that unimaginable glory that God has for us as a church. And maybe there's something going on in your heart. As we continue to pray for Rick and Mary Lou, remember you can come forward and leave that burden with God today as well. We want 100%. So often we have decided just to accept a little bit of this and a little bit of that from God when he is desperately standing right beside you wanting to pour 100% of himself, 100% of his love, 100% of his peace, 100% of his joy, 100% of his healing, his comfort, all of that is yours. What is stopping us? May it be absolutely nothing that God may be glorified inside these walls and outside of these walls. So we're going to take a few more minutes. If you want to come and pray for Rick and Mary Lou, that would be great. If you want to come and pray on your own, that would be great. And just take some time before the Lord, and then we'll wrap up in a little bit here.
You know, when God does his thing, he wears you out too, just so you know. Uh, thank you for your prayers. Uh, okay, this is my friend Wendy that needs to have a word because uh, I trust her deeply. So here. I feel very strongly in my spirit that there are some of you that heard Rick's message this morning and you thought, yeah, that's well and good, but that's not for me. And you're, you're just a, a day away or a moment away from, you're, you're just a day or a moment away from quitting on that prayer. And you're hurting deeply because whatever that thing is that you've been praying and praying and praying for, it has not come to pass yet. Yet. And the Lord wants me to remind you that God is good. He is good. And God's timing and your timing. He, he's doing something that you can't see in this time. So while you may be in your flesh ready to throw in the towel, the Lord has asked me to remind you today hang tight. He knows you're tired. And he's the one who said, come to me, all who are weary, and I will give you rest. Amen. Thank you, Wendy. That's why we listen to, uh, to the Lord and why we listen to, to people, because God speaks uh, through his people. So uh, we're, we're blessed. <laughs> I'm blessed to have some great colleagues in ministry, friends. Uh, and we're, uh, we're blessed here at Asbury and blessed to have these folks with us today. I want to read one thing quickly uh, that came after the 8 o'clock service for uh, a couple that could not be here. But they watched us live stream. This is so cool. Where's Carol Smith when you need her? You know, about the, you know, the whole technology thing. She's up there going, okay, Rick, I get it. Bless her heart. Says, sorry, we weren't in church today, but we were watching the live stream. What a powerful service. Just want you to know that we were hovered around the laptop watching and praying with you and Mary Lou. I got it. I got it. I think I got it as well. What was weird was that the house suddenly shook. I haven't figured out if there was a very timely earthquake or what was going on. I'm guessing the Holy Spirit was moving in our house. Oh, wow. <laughs> That's awesome. Anyways, God's doing his thing. Thank you, Wendy, for the reminder that we got. I mean, don't give up. Do not give up. Okay? God hasn't given up on you, so don't give up on him. All right? Keep at it. And, and one more thing before we just sing. Uh, I told Mary Lou, I said, you know, uh, during, people would say, I hope you have a restful break, you know, between Christmas and New Year's. And I, it, I was just, I don't know, agitated, not agitated, I, I don't know. Uh, anyways, uh, so there was this, what I'll call holy discontent, all right? And then, so yesterday morning, I believe it was, in my little... Uh, man coop as I was down there praying in this little chair and, and it just just seemed to me that ah, oh, okay I, I'm really sensing okay Lord I, I think I know now about this 2020 thing about a couple phrases that I really want to want to lift up as we move forward pressing in and pressing on those two phrases and I'm thinking, oh, God, that's awesome. Pressing in, meaning the relationship with God, that we grow deeper in our relationship with God. Pressing in through a relationship with Jesus, through the power of the Holy Spirit. 
and then pressing on in the persistence that Wendy talked about. The persistence, the keeping on. We got to keep at it because there's going to be times where we, where we feel like giving up. And, and a lot of our friends feel like giving up right now. That's why I said we got to be cheerleaders out there. So uh, that's what we're going to be doing. All right. And so uh, I invite you now to stand. I think this is a great song because, you know, as we think about what God does, he frees us up from the chains. Paul was talking about the chains in Colossians. Well, this is about the amazing grace and the fact that our chains are gone by virtue of his grace at work. So let's sing it together, shall we?